This guy's garage. Like and subscribe. So we begin now with Joan Donovan. Uh, Ms. Donovan, for five minutes, please. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you for the invitation to testify at this hearing. I'm Dr. Joan Donovan, and I've spent my career studying harmful online campaigns, including mis- and disinformation and media manipulation. I'm an assistant professor at the Boston University's College of Communications, and until recently, I worked for Harvard Kennedy School of Government as the research director of the Shorenstein Center and the director of the Technology and Social Change Research Project, also known as TASC. TASC focused on online media manipulation campaigns and influence operations by bad actors, including adversarial nations running mis- and disinformation campaigns, skewing public discourse and seeding hate, violence, and incitement online, and of course, undercutting democracy's free and fair elections. Before Harvard, I led my research at Data and Society, a nonprofit where me and my team mapped how social institutions were intentionally disrupted through online campaigns. I chose to join Harvard after a lengthy recruitment period because they convinced me they would support this work at scale. And as we know, governments around the world and the public have come to rely on my work as well as many other researchers in this field. But from my work, they've learned who is behind COVID misinformation, especially the uh, calls for uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, we also have learned what domestic and foreign operatives are doing to create division in communities and explaining the behavior of 81 countries that deploy cyber troops to manipulate public opinion online. I've worked with the WHO and the CDC on strategies to mitigate medical misinformation. And most recently, I've worked with the Canadian Election Misinformation Project at McGill University. In my whistleblower disclosure submitted on behalf of, uh, on my own behalf by whistleblower aid, my team's groundbreaking research in this field was ground to a halt in obeisance to Facebook by the Dean of Harvard Kennedy School, a man now known for his deference to donor interests. In short, in October, 2021, a well-known Facebook fixer became enraged in a donor meeting when I told the group I had Francis Haugen's entire catch of internal Facebook documents, and that I planned to create a public collaborative and archive of them. I said they were the most important documents in internet history. This donor uh, and Facebook PR executive attacked everything I said at that meeting. He said Facebook, uh, he and Facebook affiliated donors have powerful influence at Harvard. And so that was the start of the Kennedy School's campaign to stop my work and create unceasing misery for my research team. When Harvard received a donation of half a billion dollars from Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the fate of my research was sealed. HKS killed the task project and fired me after silencing me and my team for two, two years. Courtney Radich testified here that the tech giant intimidation includes researchers and academics in furtherest weaponization of the big tobacco and big oil playbooks, silencing and skewing research, protecting their profits and their lives to the public. But unlike the censorship campaigns of those before them, tech giants have more tools in their disposal because they control the information landscape and the data about it. Meta's actions in Canada, for instance, to fight C-18 have deprived Canadians of more than 5 million news interactions a day, according to McGill's Media Ecosystem Observatory. So you see the damage of their for-profit motivation acutely in Canada. And as Imram Ahmed from countering, uh, the Center for Countering Digital Hate testified here, we know that bad actors fill the vacuum when credible news and information leave them with little else to look at. When a school like Harvard is complicit in corporate direction of research, what can protect those of us who work to document, analyze, and share the truth? As others have noted, Facebook's actions to avoid accountability 30 has seconds, targeted please. legislators, regulators in U.S. and Canada. Um, 
I do want to close by saying this, that I support the Online Algorithm Transparency Act, known as C-292 here in Canada, and the similar legislation introduced in New Zealand, the UK, and the European Union. I was raised with the deepest conviction that I'm responsible for the consequences of my actions, and tech giants must be too. As an academic, I have a moral obligation to tell the truth then and now. Thank you very much. Very much, Miss Donovan. And I, I did not even go to a party last night, guys. But I even forgot what the topic was this morning. So excuse me. I'm going to say for the record what the topic is: um, tech giants' current and ongoing use of intimidation and subversion tactics to evade regulation in Canada and around the world. Um, I'd like to ask a question to. Um Ms. Donovan, um, uh, in regards to higher education in general, I know you had an experience with, uh, with Harvard, but in general, uh, in America today, um, how uh, powerful is big tech when it comes to uh, controlling the voice of uh, research? Thank you so much for the question. Um, I think it's, it needs to be investigated across the board. It's not just the case that Facebook is funding research, but they also are providing contracts to researchers, not just at universities, but civil society. And it's an attempt to make academia and research into a wing of their own PR. And what they have in these contracts, which I think is um, awful, are kill clauses or veto clauses that say that Facebook has the right to read your research prior to publication and decide if they think that it's met their privacy standards. And privacy isn't just about users, it's also about the products, the corporate products themselves. So if you're a researcher and you want to study the uh, algorithmic impact of Facebook's products, you have to be very careful that you're not uh, also sharing what Facebook would consider trade secrets or they could shut your research down if they're also funding you. And so my own experience isn't one of just um, my own, but also there were two other whistleblowers, one at McGill and another at Berkeley who came forward in the Washington Post just after me. One of them had Facebook called him, um, who one of the researchers at Berkeley had a grant from Facebook. And they called him after he said something critical and said that we're, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. We're we're friends. Um, and so I think it's really important that we understand that Facebook has executives that have gone out and have taken up positions on advisory boards at nations, uh, at universities across the U.S. and Canada. And they use that soft power and influence to direct research agendas. And so we need um a full court press from governments across the globe to understand the uh, web of influence that Facebook has created across academia. I like uh, I like the basketball analogy that you just used. <laughs> um, uh, so, if uh, considering the scale of the these companies, if uh, and again going back to the fact that some of them are bigger than uh, G twenty countries in regards to its value uh, in comparison to the GDP. Uh, if they wanted to intimidate, they have the power to do so, correct? I mean, they're already behaving like a nation state in terms of their negotiation on C-18. Uh, if you're a business that serves the public interest and that you understand uh, that your role in society, especially seconds. for um, Facebook, is to uh, share information with the world, then you have a public obligation to serve the people and that that is the greatest thing that your technology could do. And so I do think, though, that Facebook's behavior as a state like entity where they feel that they can negotiate uh, at this top level is, is abhorrent. And I, the last thing I would say is that there is a one million, a one billion dollar subsidy from Canadian government going to Facebook. And I think that that is something that needs to be addressed. Sort of what is your understanding of or how do you see um, the risk profile growing over the course of the next uh, little while for these communities, particularly uh, given the way in which we've seen the influence of bots, the influence of foreign governments, the influence of others in trying to foment discord and hate uh, on these on these large platforms? So. I um, began my research on uh, internet 
network social movements looking at the Occupy movement primarily. But uh, as my attention turned to white supremacist groups online, I was able to use the same methods that I used to look at online <clears throat> social movements to think about the formation of what later became known as the alt-right. So this um, networked social movement of certain charismatic individuals, certain uh, moneyed players that were funding this, and it culminated in what my research looks at particularly, which is this uh, wires to the weeds effect. What is it that gets said online that then ends up in public spaces? And I do know that uh, in Canada, there were numerous organizations like the Oath Keepers that were active, as well as the Proud Boys, uh, that formed through not just their own uh, inertia, but also aided by platform companies, allowing them a place to uh, germinate and grow. And since then, a lot of the research in this field has been about removing these bad actors from main stage platforms. I'm particularly unnerved that Musk returned Alex Jones, uh, who I think has a nearly $2 billion uh, fine uh, ahead of him for having maligned and harassed the families in the victims of Sandy Hook. Um, this is scary because this person, along with many others, organized um, the, January 6th, the riots at the Capitol. And what we do understand is that platforms aren't just the space for speech. They're also a networking uh, and organizing space for action. And that includes surfacing resources for far-right extremist groups. I've been very um, pleased with groups like uh, the American uh, group or the organization Color of Change, which launched this blood money campaign and an effort to get places like MasterCard and PayPal not to serve uh, payments to extremist groups, known white supremacist groups. But what we know about platform companies is that for a long time, they ignored the problem. Then when we got them to take responsibility for it, um, they did hire people to do that work. But now... As the public has shifted uh, or the public opinion of platforms has shifted, they're not um, getting any rewards by putting out their information about the transparency related to extremist groups on their platform. So they stop investigating. And this is what's at stake for 2024 is that if we can't depend on platforms to uh, understand and uh, moderate their own territories, that governments like Canada are going to have to step up and step in and say that this is a serious problem. Well, I'd like to just pick up a little bit of what you've uh, of what you've been kind of uh, talking about here. Look, and I'd like to now talk about YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, we have had political leaders in this country who have used hashtags in their own in their own, in their own search criterion for for their um, for their videos, and you know, uh, one of them that was used was a misogynistic a hashtag that was misogynistic that was intended to to build out a certain user base and a certain sort of viewer base um, that was used by now the current leader of the opposition. And I'm curious as to whether or not you can talk to us a little bit about what the implications of that are in terms of what algorithms start to do and how. When you start to use those hashtags, what kind of rabbit holes it's ta it takes viewers down and some of the consequences of that? Yeah, so uh, I have been researching YouTube. For Thank a you for the now. question, but we've run out of time. Answer it in another round. Yeah, so when I think about this, I think about classical social movements theory where people are only going to be motivated to do something in this world if they feel that. Uh, there is outrage and hope for change. And so often what we see online is with this rage baiting is this call to outrage um, that then hope in, in some instances, people are hoping will change um, ordinary citizens behavior. If we think about the United Nations um, uh, ex uh documentation on the freedom of expression. We have three rights with the freedom of expression. Of course, the right to speak. 
we can say anything whenever we want. We have the right to receive information. That is when, uh, let's say, a forest fire is happening, we would hope that uh, an, an information intermediary like Facebook would serve us news about how to be safe. But the last part of freedom of expression that we often forget and matters so much, so much for how we understand social media and algorithmic amplification is that we have the right to seek the truth. We have a right to the truth. And this comes from uh, post Holocaust um, political theorizing about, well, what does it mean to seek the truth and, and who has purchase on the truth? And how do we arrive at truth? And so algorithms do not care if what you're posting is true or false. And they also do not care if what you're posting is incitement to violence, because that's going to drive the rage, which is going to drive, uh, as Matthew just said, the, the engagement. And so I think we have to really concentrate on rewarding platforms and also journalism that protects the right to seek information. And the last thing I'll say about that is what we need are rules that make sure that people have talk, which is timely, accurate, local knowledge. And those are the, the building blocks for democracies. Having an informed citizenry that is educated, that has access to our own heritage and histories, paramount in this moment. And what social media has done is really inverted that uh, need for society and commodified it and then mixed it with entertainment and rage bait. 